Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. So today we read about Peter being pulled out of the water by Christ. It begins, of course, with Christ coming to him and walking on the water. And I've heard people say to me, that's impossible. Actually, it's not. It's not impossible for this reason. The creation has a native order. It's in disorder. It experiences disorder. Not dissolution, but disorder because of the fall. But the creation has a native order. In fact, what redemption of man is, is also the redemption of the creation. And as man is redeemed, and as, as, as time goes on, there will be a point when the disorder returns to order. That's what redemption means. Something is redeemed. Something is brought back to what it was. And so, the Lord, as the creator of the creation, because he's the one who spoke it into existence, this ordering of the creation is held together by the very power of his word. Because when he spoke the world into existence, the ordering is in that power. The very fact that the creation has order and that the disorder is so consistent that it becomes predictable, that's how we draw what we call the laws of physics out of it. The laws of physics are really just an exemplification of this predictability that it is not, it is quite understandable to see how Jesus could walk on the water. If he who spoke the creation into existence, it means that the very ordering of the creation comes from him who spoke it, from him who knows its order, and also from him who will redeem it. So to say that Christ walked on the water, then, is to say the one who walked on the water is the one who knows how the creation is ordered. And he's also the one who is reordering it. And Peter somehow, fundamentally, grasped that. Not necessarily in the way that I explained it, but he grasped he grasped it in, in the very, in, in, in the knowledge that only the soul can comprehend. And that's why he had the boldness to ask the Lord, I want to come to you and I want to walk on the water too. And the Lord said, what? Do it. Do it. And he did. And so he's walking on the water. And he's walking on the water by the power of his faith in the Lord, the Creator, the one who spoke the very creation, the entire universe, into existence. There is, we see, a kind of congruence here between Peter and the Lord. And that Peter walked on the water too. It's not just the Lord. It's also Peter. It's a prefigurement, in a sense, of what will come. And we have glimpses of this in the scripture. Peter walks in the water. The lion will lie down with the lamb. Enmity, division, disorder will be redeemed back into harmony where there is no destructive, deconstructive energy in the creation anymore. It comes into the creation how? It comes into the, the creation through a lie, the 
devil told Adam and Eve, you will be like God. But it, it comes in through the lie, but it, it comes in by the hand of man. Because he believed the lie, Adam sinned, the disorder enters. The second Adam, well that's what Paul's, Paul calls Christ, comes into the, the creation to reverse the disorder. How does he do it? He enters death because the the, the fundamental result of that primal sin of, of listening to the lie and believing to the lie is caused the death that separated man from God, and he goes into death and he destroys death, and thus the power of the liar. What happened was, when they died, when they entered into death, and death is experienced in different ways, it's not just the separation of soul from the body at the end of life, it's also the separation of man from himself, man from woman, and woman from man, and man from the creation. So there's this division in God's creation, and there's this division in man, and there's a division between man and woman. And that is caused by the disobedience. That's what we define as death, and also the separation of soul and body at the end of life. Right? And man has no power to overcome that. We have no more power to overcome that than we have the power to be born. There's some things that are just out of our hands. And life and death is one of them. They belong ultimately to God. So Christ becomes man, enters into death, is raised from the dead, thereby destroying the power the, the power of the enemy, of the liar, of the devil, and releasing man from that bondage. How are we released from that bondage? We are released from that bondage by our baptism into Christ. That's what it is. And if we are baptized into Christ, that's where the redemption begins. And the redemption then is the movement back to the harmony and the wholeness that it was in the very beginning. And we see, as I said, examples in, script in Scripture where that is promised and also experienced. It's promised, as I said, in the prophets. Isaiah, the lion will not lie down with the lamb. It's, it's, the example is also Peter walking on the water with Jesus. But it's also examined in our, it's also exemplified in our own lives as well. It is. We have seen by our own hands, some of the works of God. We've seen people heal. We've seen a baby heal. We've seen a lot. And that is the same as Peter walking on the water. Things that that could not have been have happened. And that's because the world is being redeemed. Now I want to make a special point. All this is a preface to one point I want to make today. God works in everyday life. That's where he works. God works in everyday life. Everyday life is fundamentally a sacred enterprise. Who is my neighbor? Anybody who you meet. Today, that's your neighbor. I'm looking for God up here. No, look for him here. Lift your heart up to.
to him and purify your heart, but do your work at zero altitude. That's where it happens. That's where it happens. I got a phone call one day. Somebody was in distress, and it was quite clear what she needed, and she was asking me, what should I do? And I told her. And then she went again, and she told me what her problem is. What should I do? I told her again. It was the same thing. This really happened. Third time. Tells me what the problem is again. What should I do? And I told her again. Now, three strikes, you're up. I'm not going to do this all night. So I asked her. I said, where's God? Where does God live? I'm trying to bring her kind of to bring clarity to her. I asked her, where does God live? And, it, and she, I, I could tell, it was, took her aback. And she said, I, in heaven? I said, yeah, he lives in heaven. Where else does he live? And she stumbled around a bit. And, and she said, I don't know. I said, he lives in reality. And if you want to find God, like you're telling me you want to find Him, you have to live in reality too. Stop living up here. That's a fantasy. That's a myth. That's imagination. You can't bring that imagination into reality. What you have to do, you have to step into reality and you have to live it. And if you live in reality, in everyday life, God can actually come and meet you, and God can actually come and help you. So Peter, they were just fishing. That's what they did. They fished that night. I don't know why. Maybe they fished that night in that day. I don't know. Maybe it was too hot in the day to fish. Maybe the fish didn't bite in the morning. Maybe they, they only bit when the, the sun went down. Who knows? But they were fishing at night, and a storm came up, and Jesus walked on the water then to give to what? To give them encouragement, to give them hope. Peter, as I said, comes and walks on the water, but then he begins to sink. Then he begins to sink. I'm sure what happened was, I don't know, it doesn't say it in Scripture, so this is just my own speculation. So the Scripture is worth $100, my speculation is worth 25 cents. But it might be right. Who knows? He's probably walking on water and he's thinking, what am I doing? I can't walk on water. And he begins to sink. The reason I think that is because Christ upgrades him and said, oh, you little thing, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? I am the creator of the world. I am your savior. Why don't you believe in me? But this is the beautiful thing. This is the beautiful thing. Even though he doubted and he began to sing, the Lord, the Lord still reached out to him and pulled him up. I love that. I love that. Yeah, we should have faith. Yeah, we should not doubt. But sometimes our faith is small, and sometimes we do doubt. But the Lord still comes down and pulls them up. And he'll pull you up too. It's just undoubtable. Absolutely undoubtable. Why? Because God is good. If anyone doubts the benevolence of God, contemplates the crucifixion. Contemplate what he did. If there is no greater love than a man gives his life for his friend. That's the greatest love. When a man gives his life for a friend. And that's what Jesus did. That's what he did. Of course he's going to pull Peter out of the water. Of course he's going to help you. It's the very nature of God. It's who he is. 
That's what love is. And if a man would give his life for a friend, how much more would he do for his sons? And that's male and female alike. The sonship of God has a very specific meaning. It means an adoption into the family. The parent becoming the parent, the father of the adoptee. We're all adoptees. Loving us as his own. So if a man asks for bread, will his father give him a stone? No. He'll give him bread. That's what he'll do. Our Lord is a very merciful God. It's by the mercy of God we are led to repentance. Why do we repent? Why do we put up our sins? Ultimately because God is good. And His goodness is to be more desired. And we're talking about the deepest desire of our soul than death. And the Lord knows us. The Lord knows us because He created us too. We're part of the creation. The difference is that all of the creation was spoken into existence. We come out of that speaking in a sense because he took out of the dust of the ground, he fashioned man and he breathed into him and man became a living soul. And that's us. That's us. So there's a lot to say about this parable, a lot. We could talk about it for two hours, but we're not going to. He lifts Peter up, and Peter goes back where? Does he swim to the shore? No, he goes back into the boat. You know what the boat is? The boat is the church. That's what it is. The fellowship and the accompaniment of the disciples who would become the apostles, who would become the founders of the church. Christ is the founder of the church, but it's through the preaching of the gospel by the apostles that the church, that the church, of course, grew in all the nations. And so for us, we learn about living in reality. We learn about who this Christ is, who we meet in reality in everyday life. We meet him in the boat, in the church. And so here we are today, right, Gina? Yeah. That's what it's about. That's what the parable teaches us. It's a lot to ponder here. Ponder it. Ask the Lord for wisdom. Christ lives in reality. When you feel yourself sinking, don't panic. He's pull you up too. He's going to pull you up too. We learn and experience these things initially in the church. So through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, may the Lord have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Please God.